Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Well, it is the last episode of the year. Uh, I'm posting this on December 29th, 2020, a year we all hope to forget. Between the shows I recorded in person until early March, um, the remote ones since then, the COVID check-ins and a, a pair of memorial episodes, this is the um, 121st episode that I post in 2020, which means one just about every three days, which does not seem possible to me. Um, I talked before about how difficult it is for me to, to recollect the anxiety from April and May. And that's when I was, I was posting a new check-in episode almost every morning with another past guest of the show. Early on, I was posting them the instant I finished the, the conversation. I would just turn around and, and fire it up with a little intro. But, you know, I, I learned to pace it a little bit, wait till the next morning, get everything out then. And, and, and somehow I made 60 shows in 65 days, according to my calendar. Um, but the act, the act of scheduling another conversation and, and hearing from another friend about how they were coping in, in those early panic days and then sharing it with you, that, um, that kept me from, from falling too far into myself when, when things were really bleak here in New Jersey. Things are bleak all around the world, all around the country. Um, but in those, those harder days when we really didn't know, um, without that, without doing that as, as often as I did, I, I don't know how I'd have gotten by. So what I'm saying is if 121 episodes in a year sounds impossible to me and to you, that's because it is. Um, this has been a year of the impossible and the inevitable. And I hope to be back next week with another episode or two to, to kick off 2021. And I hope you're all able to, to ring in the new year safely. So with that out of the way, uh, let us get to our year-end podcast. The writer James Osland rejoins us this week. and James was on the podcast in early 2019 to talk about his memoir, Jimmy Neuroses. And this time we get to talk about a project that was simmering then. Uh, it's the first book in his World Food series of cookbooks, World Food Mexico City, from 10 Speed Press. Now, Amy and I have talked about where we want to travel first when the pandemic is over. And even before this whole situation began, Mexico City came up a few times, starting with my first conversation with James, who makes his home there. Turns out Amy had been interested in going there for, for quite a while. I just didn't know or yeah, whatever. Um, anyway, we saw a couple of food travel shows set in Mexico City, and that raised our interest level even further. But... But James's new book has absolutely sealed the deal between the amazing cuisine he captures and the the, the hauntingly beautiful visuals of the the city and its its surroundings, which are captured in uh, about 150 photos by James Roper, um, and the people whose lives and whose food James chronicles throughout the book, World Food Mexico City is mouthwateringly gorgeous and puts that city on the top of our list of, of places to visit. This book gives you an experience not just of the, the public and private food of Mexico City, but, but of the lives that inhabit the place. And it's a heck of an achievement, and, and one that shows the deep love James has for his adopted home. 
Now, as we talk about during this episode, I am a self-professed disaster in the kitchen. I believe I inherit that from my mom. Um, but I did promise James that I will try one of his salsa recipes, which sounds harmless. Um, and I'll move on from there if I don't burn down the house or lose any fingers. I uh, haven't had time to, to do that first salsa recipe yet. I promise I will post video of that when it's it's done. Amy will be on hand with her iPhone and a fire extinguisher and a tourniquet. Um, they'll also... Um, I'm going to post a little video of James's home to accompany this episode, which brings me to my only caveat about this episode. And I've, I've been sparing with those this year, figuring that you guys know what some of the limitations are when it comes to, to recording remotely. Uh, because of some technical issues, James and I had to record this one via Zoom instead of Zencaster. So the audio is a little different than the, the standard remote show that I've been doing. That said... Now that we've pulled it off, it means I have yet another weapon in my arsenal for recording remote shows, so yay. And before we started, James took me on a little video tour of the, the apartment and some of the views, so that's what I'm going to share with you. Anyway, uh, here's James's bio. James Oslin travels extensively in search of the world's best restaurants, street food stalls, markets, and home cooks. He has been writing about international cultures and their cuisines for decades, and was editor-in-chief of Savour for eight years, where his work garnered many accolades, including from the James Beard Foundation, the International Association of Culinary Professionals, and the American Society of Magazine Editors. His cookbook, Cradle of Flavor, was named one of the best books of the year by the New York Times and Good Morning America. He was also a judge for five years on Bravo's Top Chef Masters. His new book is World Food, Mexico City, which I should add is part of an ongoing series. We'll talk about that during the show. And now, the 2020 Virtual Memories Conversation with James Osland. Yeah, I know we talked about it a little when we, we had our conversation, gosh, two years ago. But tell me how the, the book and the series came together, the the World Food Series and this the, the debut volume in, in the whole run. Well, you know, I've been dreaming um, my entire life about making a cookbook series, going back to my early childhood exposure of the Time Life series, Foods of the World. I first knew it, you know, checking checking it out from the local library, uh, probably when I was around eight or nine years old. And, and those books really, really had a gig gigantic impact on, you know, my curiosity for the world, it just, they really opened up this incredible doorway. And, and so in me all along, ever since, you know, I was around that age, I think I had, you know, had this idea to make a series that celebrates the greatest food places on the planet and, and t attempts to connect the dots between these great, wonderful food cultures. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to focus on the differences, say, between, you know, how food is prepared in the Middle East versus how it is prepared traditionally in Latin America. But actually, if you pull back just a little bit, you see all of these fantastic similarities. And that, that for me, is just a real driving force. And you know, why Mexico City to kick it off? I know it's where you live, but, you know, what was the, the impetus? And editorially, were they cool with, you know, this is where it needs to, to begin? You know, I'll tell you, it's a real personal reason why Mexico City is the first book in world food, a series that I hope will be around for volumes to come. And the reason is that Mexico city was the first foreign city that I ever knew. When I was 17 years old, my dad and I took this wild, completely foolhardy uh, road trip from his home, um, which was then in Louisiana. This would have been in 1980. And we drove in his station wagon all the way through the entire length of the country of Mexico. And we stopped off coming and going in Mexico City. 
And I'll tell you that very first time when we were coming down and we had parked the car and we stepped onto the Zocalo, the main plaza of Mexico City, just this enormous, enormous public space. Um, and on one side of this plaza is the main, is the cathedral of, of Mexico City, you know, which is largely constructed from rocks made from the ruins of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec city. And I was like, where are we? This is incredible. <laughs> and so I, it changed my life. It changed my life. And it felt like the right thing to do to kick off this series that's so important to me spiritually almost that, that it be the, the first book be about Mexico City. And, and to get away from the, the book itself, how has the city changed for you over the years? It hasn't changed for me. Yeah. Mexico City and my relationship with it is remarkably constant. I've, you know, over the years, I, I've, I've traveled to Mexico City probably more than 40 times. Um, it was always my secret getaway when I lived in New York City and worked in the magazine world. When I needed, you know, when I needed to be in yeah. Mexico City, I could very easily be there. And it gave me that, you know, in four hours, that jolt of, of, of for foreignness and Mexico and Mexicanness. And so I've always been coming here. But um, when we started working uh, on the first volume of World Food, Mexico City, I uh, realized, wow, I could actually live here. I don't have to live in New York City anymore. I'm not working in the magazine industry right now. And so it's not necessary that I live in New York. Wow, I could live in Mexico City. And so, and so I did. And I've been here roughly four years now. And at what point did you feel like you, you knew the city well enough and, and knew the not just the cuisine, but the, the, the people and the history and the, the culture to kind of bring that all together in the process of this book? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, I just mentioned that I'd been to Mexico City just a ton of times, mm -hmm. um, usually for fun. But sometimes I worked here. I, I worked on uh, some some stories for Sever in Mexico City probably about 15 years ago. And I once upon a time, I was a theater critic and, and wrote an article about um, experimental theater in Mexico City in the in the 1990s. And so. But usually I was experiencing Mexico City more as a as a, a lover of the city and a visitor to it rather than someone who was working here. And so when I when we started work on creating the first book in the series, I knew that I had to put a lot of that information that I held in my own experience of the city aside. And for the reader. And for the book itself, I had to come in to Mexico City and experience it as much as I possibly could anew. And um, so we, and by we, I mean um, myself and James Roper, who was the photographer on the book, traveled uh, to Mexico City, well, exactly four years ago. It was uh, in November 2016. It was the day after Donald Trump was elected by complete coincidence, we were on a plane to begin the work country. on the Mexico City <laughs> book. It was just complete coincidence. And we just immediately, you know, fell very deeply into it. And we shot that this volume in four months. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, there were there were more than 30,000 images that were taken and um, for the book. And of course, only around 150 odd images made it ultimately. But there were so many that were just so stunningly beautiful but i we we started a journey in november 2016 to capture the essence of mexico city through its cooks to let them show us what their city means to them in the kitchen and my hope was with that formula that readers then would be able to experience the city in this really intimate, almost, almost private, very, very authentic way. So this isn't, you know, this, this isn't a book series about, you know, we're, you know, 
we're, you know, taking Mexico City and digesting it through, you know, um, American cookbook writer sensibilities. No, instead, we're just honoring what the people, the citizens of Mexico City, some of its finest, funnest cooks, what they're showing us. And so that's what we did. It, it, it's something that I really appreciated about the book, the sense of not just the not a, a single aspect of it, the way you go from families and their recipes and, and what's done in the home to the, the, the street food people, to the restaurants, as well as out to the, the provinces or the, the, the farms nearby and sort of what the practices there are like, that it, it does have that sort of encompassing sense, the, the totality of, you know, the culture through food, not just, you know, this one aspect of it. So kudos. Although that raises the question, how scalable is that for other cities that you haven't lived in or haven't spent as much time in? I know the next volume is Paris, or at least that's what I, I saw in the, the promotional material. This is true. The next yeah. volume is Paris, World Food Paris. Um, and, you know, to let you know, though, the book that is likely to come right after Paris is, in fact, a more pulled back uh, uh, vision of a food culture. And so the first two books are about cities, great cities, mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful, dynamic, important global food cities. To my mind, Mexico City and Paris are a kind of equivalent in, in, in the, in, in terms of the, the depth and oldness of the cuisines and how they stay alive and also how important they are on an international level. Mexico City and Paris to me exude so, so much similarity in those regards. The next book though is, will be a country. And so it'll tell a different kind of story, you know, yet still a story told by the local cooks of the place that we'll be covering in the third book. So home cooks, street food cooks, some chefs too, but the series largely focuses on the traditions of home cooking. Those are the things that intrigue me the most as the, uh, as the maker of the series and also just someone who really loves food. A lot of attention is given to chefs and high end cuisine and expensive plates, plates of food and, you know, the world, the world, the, 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 high, the world of high end food, if you right. will. And instead, really what intrigues me much, much more is what people do inside their homes to nourish themselves and their families. That's what food is. And like I say, you, you capture that beautifully in this. I wonder, well, you know, I, I wonder about, you know, American versions of that and how much, you know, I'm sure it's regional or, you know, even class-based who eats at home versus who's eating out all the time. And, you know, what that can mean from, you know, culture to culture, I suppose. But, uh, what I, I wonder, I, I know you did one cookbook slash memoir uh, or about 15 years ago. Is this the first full cookbook cookbook in your career? Uh, no, the first the first book is very much a cookbook cookbook, and that would okay. be Cradle of Flavor. Yeah. And it's about um, mostly it's about Indonesia, but it's uh, also about Malaysia and Singapore. And those are places that I've lived um, over the years, four years. Um, Indonesia is the second second home home of mine. And um, it's it's a book that, you know, really in many regards has it was the first attempt i think i don't know i'm too in the middle of all of this to really sure. know so i can't be my own my own analyst but you know it was the first book in this in this idea of capturing places through local cooks and the dishes that they make and that the extraordinary beauty and power that those dishes have and when they can be codified into recipes that capture exactly the taste of that, that kitchen where the grandmother in Java, for example, made that particular dish, how glorious that is to be able to exchange 
that recipe with a, with a reader in some far flung, flung place in Evanston, Illinois, for example, some place you couldn't imagine a further place, you know, from Java. Yet the cook in Evanston, Illinois can then go about making that recipe that that grandmother made in Java. And suddenly that, that person's kitchen fills with the aroma of a Javanese curry that's made in the traditional fashion. No shortcuts, but just following the traditional methodologies. That is an extraordinary thing that happens there. That is, that is, that is actual magic. You know, and that was the that was the idea, I think, that I was maybe poking around with with Cradle of Flavor, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And I still don't really know what I'm doing. Ninety nine percent of the time, I just sort of push myself through it. (laughs) Yeah, I wondered, like, how much your your editorial background in that respect influences the the writing and and the whole package that you're, you're trying to build as the, the the creator of the the cookbook instead of the person who's a step back editing as you did in your your magazine days well i'll tell you that's a really interesting question because yeah you know not only was i write, writing a book about the food culture the authentic real food culture of mexico city Mostly through its home cooks, as I'd mentioned. But I was also, you know, making the first book of a series. And so thus a formula needed to be figured out, a formula that could apply across many books and many locations, far flung locations. And still the formula, the template for the book would work. Um, what I had the great fortune to be doing at the same time was also working simultaneously on the Paris book. And so we produced Paris right after Mexico City, right when we, um, you know, took the last image for the Mexico City volume after those four months here. Um, uh, myself and, and, and James, the photographer, traveled to Paris and picked up for another four months of, of shooting all inside Paris, deep inside Paris, mostly inside of people's home kitchens. And um, then I came back to Mexico City where, where I live and began to figure out, all right, with all of this raw material and with and with these groups of these recipes that we want to include in in both books that that really best convey these places, classic recipes of these places, we we you know, I then had to figure out a skeleton that would carry both books along and engage the reader and intrigue them and make them want to cook these foods and look at these pictures and read these passages of text. And so I did that for the better part of two, three years. And that's when my real editorial mind kicked in. Plus also me and a a team of wonderful Mexican women that I work with um, developed the recipes for both books, both for Mexico City and for Paris. And we we developed the recipes in each book over the course of about a year each so it was a two-year process and um it was it was absolute magic but during those times that's when i was was absolutely using my my editorial brain yeah how much of a challenge was that That, that's something that struck me you're somebody who has great experience and exposure to cookbooks how much of it compiling the recipes not repeating you know, what other people, you know, have run in, in other cookbooks as, as, you know, sort of the standards, that are almost the cliches of, of different areas. And then the other question, are there recipes that people wouldn't share with you and that you you were sort of challenged to, to reverse engineer? Or, you know, were, did you have to sort of stick with you know things that you could actually... Not at all. Okay. Not at all. In both places, Mexico City and in Paris, the generosity of the cooks 
um, that are included in this, this book, they, these people are now friends. Yeah. They're all now personal friends. Every, every, every last person in, in these books, you know, um, my goodness, should we, should we make a number more of these books? I'm going to have, you know, a small city's worth of, of close <laughs> friends. You know, the food, food is a, is, you know, the, this goes back to that thing I was talking about, the world of chefs. That's where maybe more of that whole thing of, no, this is mine. I own it okay. com- tends to come in. But when you're inside of, home kitchens with home cooks. I mean, you know, grandmother might have her, you know, family reasons for not wanting. <laughs> that's to, what I was sort of wondering. You know, yeah. But that, that, those, that sure that happens, but I'm going to tell it to you straight on both the Mexico city book um, and the Paris book there. That was, no, we were, we were, we were, I was greeted with such extraordinary generosity. These cooks tend to be just so proud when they're, you know, something that really is their birthright, a favorite dish, a favorite family dish, um, you know, is shared with the rest of the world. It gives them a great, great sense of pride and joy, too. And um, hopefully the book uh, captures that. It certainly does. I mean, you write affectionately about these people in in the Mexico City book. They just they sort of come alive on the page. You, You get a sense of their homes, their lives, how they relate to the people they're eating with. And, and you know, between that and the wonderful photography, you know, I'll, I'll trust you on the recipes themselves because I will burn down the kitchen if I, if I try cooking myself. Um, but everything else about it, I'm just, you know. <laughs> I'm telling you, you won't. You need to <laughs> no. make the salsa recipe. Make the charred tomato salsa recipe. It's in the back of the book, which is a, a kind of encyclopedic. Yeah, the, the section at the end section. about the... The, about the ingredients mm-hmm. and other things yeah so back there in that entry um that's called salsa there's there's a recipe in there the first recipe that's in there mm-hmm. you should make it um it's actually very simple you can just use any kind of pan even if you had a teflon pan that's not ideal but that would be fine and you get the ingredients or your your your, your wife for example could help you know plus the ingredients for you but all you need is a couple couple whole tomatoes and, and a couple whole chilies. You don't, you don't even really need to do anything. And you grill these ingredients um, in this pan over a medium, medium high fire. And what begins to happen is the skin of each of them, the tomatoes, the chilies, they, they begin to pick up little black spots. They almost get charred. And suddenly the, the kitchen is full of this, this fantastic smell of just slightly slightly burned slightly sweet very vegetal great aroma fills the kitchen and that's the smell of the mexican kitchen and it's so easy to do because all you need is the fire the pan and these ingredients that you can get at literally any supermarket literally any supermarket and when you're engaging in that process of putting those vegetables in 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 that pan and cooking them in that way you're participating in a human legacy that is literally thousands upon thousands of years old because that dish that you're making is basically something that the very ancient people of Mexico made on a daily basis with the addition, the modern addition of, well, 500 years of, of, of the onions, but the rest yeah. of the ingredients were, 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 were are, are native to, to Mexico. And you take those just lightly charred ingredients. They're sort of somewhere between cooked and raw. You know, the tomato only really like the outer few millimeters or two of the, of the flesh becomes cooked. The rest is raw. You throw, you stem the chilies and you throw it all in the blender. You push the blender once or twice or three times, add a little salt, and you've got an ancient food of Mexico, and literally anyone could make it. So I recommend making that. Well, give it a shot. I'll even do a video of that just, just so you, know, you, you could see in case I end up missing fingers or burning the house down. We'll, we'll have That's not going to happen. Know, it's I... not going to happen. I assure you. I assure you with great confidence. Awesome. <laughs> now, it does. You know, it, it's one of those things that struck me, though, reading this and and. Well, uh, th- this will sound however it's going to sound. The differences between Mexico and America, that sense of continuity with the indigenous people. And I know there was a lot of, you saw the Spanish conquest and everything else on top of it, but 
but there's well, I live in a place in northern New Jersey that was the former hunting grounds for the Lenape Indians before, as our town handbook put it, the arrival of the colonials meant an end to the Indian way of life, which is the euphemism they used for this when we were kids. But in Mexico, it it seems like there is more, I guess, a continuity, that sense that these things are carried over, that they weren't just supplanted by by the colonials. Well, I'll tell you, you know, going back to that first trip that I made to Mexico as a 17-year-old with my father, and again, we went, we were through the entire country. I don't know. We were in like nine or 10 states by the time the trip was um, done. And, you know, like a lot of other Americans my age, I suppose, at that point, I didn't really know too much about Mexico, although Mexico was much more on on America's map back then when I grew up in the 1960s and 70s. And, you know, there was a lot more free interchange than 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 than, than there have, has been in the last 20 years. And I, I don't know exactly what that's about, um, but but that's a whole other topic. But when we drove from Louisiana to Chiapas, the southernmost state of Mexico, it, it's right next to the it's right next to guatemala and we drove um first first we were we were driving well it's in another state but we were driving to um the 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 great uh mayan ruins of um uh, palenque and we drove from palenque to san cristobal de, de las casas which is a um, exquisite colonial city in in the state of chiapas and back then you know in 1980 there was just a dirt road that you the, the, that was the only way and it went it went it went through the jungle and you know we had started this trip in the naked desert you know in you know just just on yeah. the other side of the texas border and I'm going to tell you <laughs> the entire trip, what was going through my head was I had no idea that we lived next to what is basically the North American version of Italy. And, you know, and Mexico City is, you, you know, the Mexican version of Rome. And, you know, the, the, what great luck and fortune I realized in my head that this truly magical, old, 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 complicated place is just right next door. I can take the bus to reach it. And so, you know, as soon as I discovered that, I felt like oh, a fantastic, you know, blanket, you know, is just at, just out there in this just incredibly stimulating and exci exciting, wonderful place, you know, full of, you know, some of the friendliest people you will meet anywhere. So I had the great fortune to, you know, pick, pick that one up when I was 17 years old. And do they have that sense, them, uh, the, the, the citizens themselves, that, you know, they, they feel that sense of... You know, I'll tell you, history, Mexico, Mexico is definitely... You know, one of the things that I really love about this place is one of the way, way, ways that every, every every single Mexican I've ever known in 40 years, they have like a similar coping mechanism to me, which is like to always tell a joke in there somewhere. Yeah. So, you know, Mexicans absolutely know the advantage of humor because this is a complicated country at a very complicated moment in its history yet you will not talk to one single mexican in this country of mexico or abroad that doesn't have a heartfelt love for this country sometimes that love is complicated like the relationship that we have with our parents but usually it's not and usually it's it's just this full flowing love in fact you know i i felt another version of that um on the on world when when I, when i was producing world food mexico city which is mexico Mexico City residents, Chilangos, as they're known, they love their city just as much. I mean, the worst things could have happened to them ever here, but they're like, no, 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 no. I Mexico see. City is, no, no, I love yeah. Mexico City. And, you know, I'll tell you the truth. When, when I was, like, I lived in New York for about 25 plus years and Toward my last years in New York, I don't know. I hope to be back in New York soon. I I love it. I think it's the greatest city. I truly, 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 truly do. But 
you know, New Yorkers that I would just pull. Do you love it here? People were like, no, uh, it's all right. It's changed a lot. But Mexico City, you pull everybody. And they're like, yeah, I love it here. I couldn't live anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> you found the right place. Now, let me ask, though, you're, you're, oh, talk about writing. First, well, what are your food writing influences? Are there their cookbook, you know, authors who are of, of particular influence? My wife also asked about a, a Diana Kennedy in terms of writing about Mexico and food. I've never read her, so I don't know. And I don't know reputationally if she's trying to trap me by asking you something weird. But, you know, do, do you have <laughs> food writing influences like that? Is that a, so your wife is whispering, ask him about Diana yeah. Kennedy. <laughs> so <laughs> see if he explodes with rage. Yeah, I know. No Diana idea. Kennedy is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a Mexican national treasure. Yeah. And um, she is, she's done an extraordinary job since the 1950s of of capturing the 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 cuisines of mexico because there are cuisines you know my 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 book attempts to show mexico through mexico city because mexico city represents all of mexico everyone from all over the country lives here um but diana kennedy did this extraordinary thing over the course of many 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 volumes that took years upon years upon years to produce and she she is she is a treasure and her books are are just they're works of art they're works they're classic cookbooks that are also works of art and um you know diana kennedy though also has uh, uh uh mexican counterparts too that have not been published in in, in english and so they're um they're not their works are not widely available but um there are just some remarkable mexican voices um over the course of the last three centuries that have been documenting um, um mexican food ways in, in very important important ways um as far as my own influences go you know i always i guess think of myself first and foremost as a journalist and you know i i suppose i have journalistic um idols that influenced me a, a lot when i was first writing journalistically joan didion springs to mind for example you know but for me the idea of simply reporting what i'm seeing rather than you know following i don't know some food writing trend or something like that which would be dishonest to my own creative process or my 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 own my own idea i would never really fall into that that said i mean i grew up with with the books of james beard i grew up with the books of mater joffrey i grew up with time life foods of the world like etc cetera, etc cetera. elizabeth david you know is somebody else whose books there is not one single thing that elizabeth david ever wrote that doesn't just move me to the core but did elizabeth david influence my writing no not really and this sort of writing versus the memoir that led to our first meeting two years ago? Um, Jimmy Neurosis versus yeah. World Food? Well, I'll tell you one major difference. In mm -hmm. the World Food series, the, there's no I. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not writing about myself. I'm writing about these, these, these places that I go to and these wonderful cooks that I meet along the way, but I'm not writing about myself. I'm not processing it through my own interior matter or my own emotional life or I'm just, I'm giving a joyful report on, 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 on what I'm seeing. So hopefully the reader can have a, a similar experience. Jimmy Neurosis is a piece of self journalism. Yeah. I don't really think of it so much of a, as a, as of a, a, I don't think of it as a memoir as much as I do as uh, me reporting on what I remember about what happened during my adolescence. Yet still, I think of it as a kind of pulled back piece of reporting. You know, I didn't, when I wrote Jimmy Neurosis, I didn't, um, I, I intentionally didn't want to, I didn't want to manipulate the reader into liking me or disliking me. For example, me, the lead character in the book, I just wanted to just write, write 
what I remembered happening. And sometimes it was monstrous. You know, a lot of times in memoirs, I, I, I get the sense that things have been cast in a way to make, you know, the, the lead character a little more sympathetic. And that wasn't something that, 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 that interested me. And, you know, that's how I approach all of the writing that I do. I'm just, I, you know, I, I gotta, I feel like I gotta nail it like the way it actually is. And so, you know, those, those, because that process is so much a part of my own creative way that, you know, if I'm in a kitchen in Mexico city with someone, I'm, I'm, I'm applying the same basic principles of, 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 of really trying to capture truth for, through the words that I'm using in on the printed page. It's interesting. I, I, I wondered Given you know the 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 sort of writing you do in this book and and yeah how well it it that style weaves through both that and and the mem well non memoir reportage of, of your youth. <laughs> well, thanks. No, you can call it a memoir. It's a world of shorthand. <laughs> yeah, you know, we all have to have our our terms and and you know quick ways of characterizing. But it, it's something I'd, I'd also wondered about from from your perspective and your your history within food writing and and you know covering this this whole world and now the project you're engaged in. The impact of like food travel TV, uh, you know, getting beyond the the Anthony Bourdain thing into like, well, I mean, there's so many you know examples of the genre now of of the one hour visiting somebody feed Phil going to Mexico City, you know, uh, uh, places like that. How do you see that sort of interacting with with what you know what we think of food, how we're we're exposed to it, and, and what you're engaged in with this project? Um, I'll tell you, I I. You know, I, I'm not the world's biggest watcher of food television, um, you know, uh, streaming or, you know, yeah. major network or cable network or that's not I don't tend to digest a lot of that material. But from what I have been exposed to, a lot of it's fun to watch, but it's basically it's entertainment yeah. that is very, very removed from the kitchen. And my work, my, my truest hope is that, you know, the reader will pick up World Food Mexico City. Um, you know, they might pick it up for one reason or another. Maybe they're interested in Mexico City or maybe they know something about Mexican cooking or maybe it just looked like a pretty thing to get. Um, you know, and maybe they first look at the pictures and then maybe they read some of these passages of text by, by Mexico City contributors because they're about, you know, 30 plus pieces i think in yeah. the in the book that are written written by by mexico city people um you know th i think that the idea of them then bringing the book into the kitchen and trying their hand at one of those recipes not unlike what i was talking about with you and the salsa and the smell from the ch the charring tomatoes and the and the and the chili and and the onion and the way that smells and then you you grind it in the blender you know uh, going back to that recipe traditionally that would be done in a in a in a what's called a molcajete uh it's a mortar and pestle that's made from from lava rock and you know but you can do it in a blender and you can yield more or less the same results and you see that salsa sitting in the blender and it looks like salsa and it smells Mexican and you, you eat it and it tastes like Mexico. And, you know, that that reader can have that gift to be able to do that. And maybe that salsa will then become a part of their regular rep repertoire. They don't eat it with Mexican food. They eat it with their scrambled eggs in the morning or they, you know, add, add a splash to their to their chicken soup or, 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 or whatever. TV food shows that you're talking about, those kind of docu ones, yeah. they don't usually do that for the viewer. Instead, there's a, there's a kind of passivity that, that is created and i'm so all about you know the wonder of traditional cooking around the world and upholding traditional cooking not just looking looking at things from, from through some passive armchair kind of thing but like no let's 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 keep this ancient wonderful tradition alive that's that's for me the the major difference hopefully
I, I sort of figured you were going to be something in that direction. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad I didn't offend you with the question, which is good. <laughs> but the next semi-offensive question. I'm unoffendable. Question, that that I've also figured out from our, our first yeah. conversation. <laughs> um, are, are you glad you're not in the magazine world at present? Well, the magazine world has just been so um, altered since I left it five years ago. Um, it was becoming very altered, um, you know, in the last, well, five, five, roughly five years that, that I spent in the industry, um, you know, versus when I, when I first started in the 1990s and, you know, the early 1990s. And I worked at Condé Nast. And when you walked into those offices at uh, 350 Madison and you passed by the newsstand and you went up the elevator and, you know, magazine, the magazine industry was just an entirely different thing then. Well, well, Along comes this little old thing called the internet around 20 years ago or so, and things started to slowly change, and then they started to really quickly change. And, you know, um, a niece of mine works at Condé Nast um, as uh, an editor. Um, she's a digital editor and a damn good one, by the way. But she doesn't live in New York City and walk into 350 Madison. She's living in Ann Arbor, Michigan. You know, so it's just, it's just not the, it's just not, it's just not, it's just not a, what it was exactly. Although I firmly, firmly believe that the need for printed matter, you know, f the, the phones and its, in its, its variant technologies, that tech is, is tr clearly in, in the grand scheme of things going to prove out to be one of the great, the great human event inventions, but it doesn't do everything. And when you're just scrolling through pictures on Instagram, heart, heart, you're just scrolling one picture after the other and you heart the ones that just really quickly grab you. But, you know, you, there's, there's, there's not a lot of like depth of experience there. And if you're doing that for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours a day, you get kind of tired. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, I think that magazines, world, world food, which for me is a, it's a kind of magazine. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a periodical. It comes out once a year, every fall. And, you know, I think that the need for that is, will never go away because the relationship that we have with a physical book, that picture that we love on page 125 and that recipe over on page 190. Oh gosh, you can see all the splatters on the page because we've made that recipe so many times. We just love it. And I even know how to make this recipe from by heart right now, but like, I have to go back to the book itself, books, magazines, they're not going to go away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm dying that I only got to see the book as a PDF between the, the copy your publisher is sending and the one that my quote unquote local bookstore is sending that's become lost in media mail. It's killing me that <laughs> I have a physical edition of this because the images are so gorgeous, but they're spread out on, on this big ass monitor that I have downstairs <laughs> as opposed to just, you know, being able to, to, you know, again, be in the kitchen or be in the living room and just, just open up and, and start looking at these. And touch know. paper yeah. like, with your fingers and have a book in your lap. And yeah, yeah because yeah, stuff, stuff's okay. I'm computer screens but really at the end of the day it's like you know weird throbbing white light you know <laughs> yeah and even you know on a laptop or oh, you're 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 shrunk you have to start zooming in you, you miss you know oh, being able to see a thing completely. Yeah. Now, completely and also pictures they only really reproduce on paper yeah. you know photographs really really only reproduce there They're, they can be quite magical you know on a computer screen or on a, on a cell phone screen but but there is it's not it's not the same yeah now do you think there's room for innovation or or inventiveness within the cookbook form is it something you've you you look at as you know we could do a cookbook differently somehow or is it still a a i just don't know like is it a formal structure that you know really satisfies you know whatever sort of you know approach you're trying to bring to it no, because I think about, you know, my own favorite personal cookbooks, uh, Mimi Sheraton's uh, German cookbook, um, a, a few Maher Joffrey titles, um, Elizabeth David, 
all of her books, as I'd mentioned, um, Zuni Cafe uh, Cookbook, which is, you know, really, truly one of my top three cookbooks. Grace Young, her books about uh, wok cooking. She's a dear friend of mine and an extraordinary um, interpreter of, of Chinese cooking. Um, you know, all of those books that I've just thought of and named, they they all follow well, what is essentially the same structure. And, you know, they're all sort of broken down, you know, the same way. And I, I go back to, you know, it, it's a form that works. And if it's not broke, don't fix it. Yeah, You know, I mean, cookbooks, the ones usually that we develop deep relationships with, they're the, the, the traditionally formatted cookbooks. They're not like the new, wow, oh gosh, here's the new Instagram interpretation of like how we're going to cook in the kitchen. No, that stuff sort of feels like, you know, garage sale stuff to me. Gotcha. And that's what I was sort of wondering. It's It's a form that's infinitely adaptable. You know that 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 exists. You know as a genre, but you can do so like much the, with it. Like the nonfiction book or the novel, too. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't. You you probably wouldn't. Well, you you might because it is <laughs> it is part of your job. Ask the question of, of a novelist. You know about you know new forms, but probably most novelists, especially the ones that had been doing it for 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 a while to great success, they probably would say, you know. And I'm not saying that I've done anything to great success truly 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 yeah. but 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 they would probably say no the novel works because it's it's infinitely bendable and so is so is the cookbook form you know it's infinitely bendable you know but the the most important thing is the recipes in the book and whether or not they work and my very first cookbook editor a true true legend and genius um maria guarnaschelli uh she's she's the the mother of of, of the of the of Food Network star Alex Guarnaschelli, um, you know M Maria is a fierce fighter for that. And you look at the cookbooks that she, she created over the over the ages, and you know they're the most a lot of them are the most important cookbooks of the last 40, 50 years. And, you know, I've really learned that from her. I owe that to her that idea, and I think it works. And. I guess as a sort of meta connection to that, it's it's something that struck me within the within World Food Mexico City, the sense of the the, the culture in Mexico adapting to new ingredients from other countries. You know, we all know you know e e this is a world of of interaction and and you know cosmopolitanism, but there are things in there that you know yeah they they imported this and it became this this staple of a sort. Um, you know, you have the well, the whole world and, does that. The yeah. whole world story of food. You know, I also lived in India and um, in the south of India for, for a few years. And, the, you know, they use potatoes and tomatoes in their daily diet. They use the Indian, South Indian food without chilies is unimaginable. It's some of the most fantastically, delightfully hot food you will ever eat anywhere. But those are ingredients that came from elsewhere. Every, Every everything kind of comes from elsewhere, um, you know. Even even before the Spanish came to uh, Mexico uh, five hundred plus years ago, yes, there were the native ingredients of beans and corn and chilies and tomatoes, etc. But there there was also a lot of interchange throughout the Americas, and who knows, maybe from from other parts. There's not a lot of recorded information about that, but every Every time you eat a banana in Mexico or um, I think even a papaya, those those are not native foods, even though they they seem completely ubiquitous to Mexico. And in fact, most of the bananas that we eat in the United States are, are, are grown in Mexico or in Central America. But, you know, the, these bananas don't come from here. They come from Southeast Asia. They moved around the world. And they've been here, you know, for a very, 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 very long time. But 
Mexico has a very, Mexican cuisines in general have a very wonderful way of taking in other ingredients from other places and making them their own. One of the best things, you know, of course, is Mexican beer cocktails, which are called micheladas. And beer, you know, of course, that's a, a, a European, a Western and Eastern European um, um, food that has very ancient roots in probably a few other parts of the world. But we think of the beer that we know largely as a European food stuff nowadays here in Mexico, where it's been popular really for only a, a century and a half or two centuries or so. They, they Mexicans, they, they Mexicanized the beer. And so they had, you know, like half a cup of lime juice to the, to the beer along with like a lot of hot sauce. And then, oh, I don't know, let's just throw in some Worcestershire sauce just for the heck of it. And then let's take a frosty, beer mug and 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 tilt the glass um first first line it with a little lime juice so it's so it's a little sticky and then tilt that glass uh top into some salt and chili powder and then drink the beer like that it's like that's what they do with all of these in, these these even the newer things that have come along they they wonderfully mexicanize them and and you know that's what you can do when you learn that that salsa is you learn like oh this is what mexican food tastes like it doesn't taste like that thing that i knew from the mexican restaurant down the road that we <laughs> order from sometimes which can be great but it's not necessarily the real taste of mexico and the idea with this series is then you get to go to the other these other places for france and just understand this is what french cooking is all about and then you know around the world you go and you go back to that thing that I was talking about where you see some more similarities and differences in technique and flavor. Which raises the big question of, of world food and the world as we know it right now. Have you been able to travel since, since the world went sideways in, in March? Well, a little bit here and there, not too much. I spent the big the question is how's your pandemic going? I, I guess that, that's the broader way of putting how's it. How's my pandemic going? <laughs> yeah. You know, I gotta say I've really I this has been a really interesting and, and not unfun year for me. I had yeah, I just I loved 2020 and I'm not saying that from a place of gloating, but like so, you know. I was just wrapping up, uh, work on the, on the, on the Mexico City book and, and also, um, wrapping up the Paris book, which will come out next fall, right at the beginning of all of this in Mexico City. And like so many at first, I was like, whoa, what's going to happen in the next couple of months? And I live in a part of Mexico City where there's not a huge amount of infrastructure in terms of like, you know, where I can get food and stuff. And in the beginning, everybody was talking about the markets were all going to close down. And like, I was like, huh. So I guess I better stock up on the beans and the rice. Um, and, yeah. you know, after a while of doing that, I realized, you know what? I am so deep in work right now. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, and I've got so many irons on the fire and I'm like, I don't know if I, you know, like worrying about what I'm going to actually eat is like the best use, use of my time. And meanwhile, my sister is like, who lives in California where I'm originally from, where I'm originally from. She was like, you have to come back to California. You have to come back to California. And so, Get out of Russia. um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, um, I left, um, uh, I left my home in Mexico City for about five months and lived in this very, very spare cabin in the mountains in Southern California in the forest. And I had these just incredible daily hikes for, for three day, for three hours a day and was also working, working my, working my butt off. Um, and then I was down in the open desert for a while, um, um, for another couple of months. And then I've been back in Mexico City for four or five months now and um working away and i mean i i go around i take the subway basically every day i've taken a couple you know like very sort of narrow Mex mexico trips but really really only a couple and i really miss hitting the road you know and just just getting out there you know because that's 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 something that really really feeds me sure 
but otherwise, as far as work and living your best pandemic life, you've you've managed to to do okay. You know, and like I said, I've just really, it's been, I, 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 I like new things yeah. and, you know, I realize that some of the newness is not ideal. I don't, I certainly don't mean to sugarcoat anything, but I find, um, I find this to be, you know, a, an interesting time to be alive. And it's definitely one of those times where it's like, Gosh, if I ever do have grandchildren, the chances of that are increasingly slim, but I mean, who knows? <laughs> I mean, and, you know, this would be, you'd want to tell them about this time and you'd want to be able to really give them a vivid and accurate account. And I mean, that's not to say that, it's, again, you know, I'm, I'm echoing something I said a moment ago. It's not all, it's not all been fun and games for me. It's been, there's been a lot of weird interrupted things. Mexico City and Paris were supposed to come out together. And so we decided with Pandemia, let's do Mexico City one year, Paris the next yeah. year, the next book the next year, and so on and so forth, which is a schedule that I love, but that was born of Pandemia. And, you know, the thing that I, I, concluded my wife and I decided yesterday going through the the book when we're able to travel again let's let's go to Mexico City that was the you know this we'd already <laughs> thought about that and and it, it stemmed from our first conversation two years ago but that was that moment of you know let's that that's something to aspire to so having a series like this that when we're we're in lockdown or when we can't go anywhere that there's something that brings the world to us that's uh yeah, it's good timing. Not that I'm accusing well, you of I starting a pandemic on us, but <laughs> can I quote you on that? I, like, I will give you a blurb for that. <laughs> can we skywrite that like right now over New Jersey? Please, please. You know, that's my that's my hope. You know, um, I'm I'm lucky enough every you know sunset to be able to walk. It's only 10, 15 minutes away to to that main plaza that I was describing with the cathedral. It's just it's just right here. And uh, Mexico City is pretty quiet right now. So so there's, you know, that's where I go take, that's where I, you know, stretch my legs and get, get oxygen in, into my lungs. And, you know, if I can bring even just a little bit of that, that sense of electricity and joy that I get when I walk to this plaza every night at sunset and look at that beautiful orange light, you know, and the cathedral and the magic of being in this ancient, ancient place, you know, if I can convey even just like an ounce of that, that's, that's a, that's a great thing. You succeeded as far as I'm concerned. Um, now, last couple of questions. You got Navidad plans? You do go into how important it is in, in Mexico. I don't actually, but um, you know the the family that I'm the closest with here. They they just they lost somebody just uh, last week to coronavirus actually, um, and so we're we're probably not gonna. Um, that's probably not gonna happen this year. But um, but you know I'm I'm pretty self sufficient. <laughs> you know I'm sure I'll I'm sure I'll eat something nice and 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 take another one of those magic walks to the to the center of, of of Mexico City where one somehow never feels alone one always feels part of something bigger and fantastic final question comes from a cartoonist pal of mine American who's lived in in Oaxaca on and off for years hmm. I, I mentioned you know Mexico City world food cookbook he said ask him about bugs because out in Oaxaca, the the grasshoppers, the cochineal, you know, there's a whole thing about eating bugs. I'm like, I don't think that's going to make it into a cookbook, Peter. But, you know, let, let me search. Did not find reference to bugs outside of the nopal cactus. In, in they're, the yeah, but, they're, they're, <laughs> yeah, bug, in, in, the eating of insects is an ancient, it's an ancient practice here and in so many parts of, of the world that, that have really old cultures, you know, insects. You know, I ate my first insects, I guess, in Mexico, and then I've eaten a lot of insects in Southeast Asia and sure. probably uh, many other places unawares. But, um, you know, insects, once you actually eat them and you see them in these local contexts, you think like, ew, that just sounds so weird and creepy. It's actually not weird and creepy at all. I I eat, you know, I eat what are called chapulines, grasshoppers. Here, yeah, that's what he mentioned. You know, yeah, yeah. I eat 
eat them, I eat them with, with, I wouldn't say constant frequency, but with some frequency. I mean, frankly, this is going to just sound so strange, but if you have like a good guacamole, like the guacamole that's in, in the book, the uh, habanero guacamole, um, mm-hmm. um, if you just, you, you, you just like toss a half a handful of these chapolines, um, they're, they're, dry fried salted sometimes with chili sometimes with lime juice grasshoppers and they're usually kind of whole and so once you get over how they look which is really not very different than a, a small brownish shrimp i, mean, I was gonna shrimp say and, we, we shrimp eat shrimp and grasshoppers exactly yeah. exactly yeah. shrimp and grasshoppers they're you know, they're definitely holding hands out there in the, in the <laughs> you know in the de- in the evolutionary development of things but when you take those grasshoppers with this this guacamole and you dip in with like a good um you know just made maybe you even made it yourself tortilla chip it's so delicious it's just like and it's 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 really subtle it's really subtle and what it does to the guacamole and then what it does taste wise and then what it does texture wise and i know that might sound weird bug legs or whatever but it's not weird once you get used to it and you realize oh this is just food this is just ancient yeah. food it's actually no weirder than literally anything else that we that we put in our mouths to nourish ourselves you know so it's oftentimes i'll have a bag of them in in my in my fridge that i'll that i'll buy from some lady who comes in from a village and sells her wares right on on the sidewalk right near my homes and our chapelines are fantastic so i heartily endorse trying them at least once in one's life i i figured the way he brought it up i was like again probably not the the thing you put in the cookbook unless it's a specific cookbook like that but yeah it didn't sound like it was well one of those. the reason they're not left out of the book because they're yeah. it's weird food it's just i i didn't have their chapelines are not in the cookbook because I couldn't include every single thing in the cuisine of Mexico City in in a in a volume that's around 225 pages. You know these these are meant to be deep dives into things that are that are key to understanding about uh, about a, a local food culture. But you know, gosh, the things that I didn't include. We shot all sorts of insects actually for for this volume, but we just didn't. Have room for them in the end and nor did we have room for one of my favorite classes of food yeah. foods in mexico it's these it's succulent plants that grow wild in the mountainsides that surround mexico city and these are some of my my favorite foods on earth they make these wonderful moles and stewed dishes with these succulents and they're just they're it's magic food you know so things like chapolines and succulents well we'll we'll save them for the next deep dive of of mexico food. Sounds awesome. Last question. Who are you reading or who are you hoping to, to read going into 2021? Any any books or authors that are on your, your nightstand? People hate this because it puts them on the spot and they feel like an idiot if they can't come up with an answer. Well, no, but. you also <laughs> you want to you want to say the right thing because all of us are reading. Usually I am anyway, like three or four things at a time. Well, that's OK. To I varying. Want- to varying with, levels of concentration. Well, I did one mm-hmm. with Michael Musto uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he was just celebrity biographies, Gil. That's that's what I read. <laughs> you know, he, he had no sense. Do you want to yeah. know what? At yeah. the beginning of <laughs> at the beginning of pandemia, when we were all really stressed out yeah. in, in March, I, I was I, I was in in California, as I'd mentioned. I was talking to a California friend on the phone, and I'm like, "Tell me what I need to read," and she's <laughs> like, "Check out this joke." Collins um, autobiography. You're going to love it. And you know what? (laughs) She was right. She was right. I did love it. But what I am actually reading now, many months later, is I'm rereading Bruce Chatwin, The Song Lines. Oh, wow. Yeah, I read that a few few months, or maybe last year, I think, his book about uh, Australia. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's for me, you know, for me, Bruce Chatwin and, and Joan Didion are my, are my, are my writing idols. And, um, you know, to that book is just, you can read it 32 times, which I probably have and, um, still not be touched by it. So that's what I'm reading. Sounds good. James, 
it is my sincere hope that my wife and I, you know, show up on your door at some point in 2021 and just say, <laughs> hi, we're, we're visiting because yeah, we want to go somewhere. You know, we want to get away and, and be able well, to travel. Mexico City is real close and I can give you my apartment code. You can buzz up. So <laughs> <laughs> or I can buzz you up. So I'll let you I'll let you know. Awesome. James, thanks so much for coming back on the show. And I, I hope we can get together for the, uh, the, the Paris book, too, next year. Oh, that sounds like fun. In the meantime, try the salsa. I realize I, that I keep harping I, on it. I've, I've got it written down You're here. You're going to listen to this recording, and I've <laughs> said it like six times, like, try the salsa. Try a, the salsa. Charred tomato salsa. I've got it written down right <laughs> yes. here. I'm going to give it yes. a shot. Amy will be, you know, yes. standing by with both a, a camera and a fire extinguisher, and we'll, we'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Let me know how that comes out. And thanks for, for, your, for your wonderful interview. Thanks so much. And have a great new year, James. Okay, you too. And that was James Osland. World Food Mexico City is, well, it's more than just a gorgeous cookbook, as I, I hope we got across in our conversation. It's really an experience of Mexico City and Honestly, I can't wait for the subsequent editions of the series to come out, starting with Paris in 2021. And I'm really hoping that the next time I record with James, it'll be at his home in Mexico City. So go pick up World Food Mexico City from 10 Speed Press from your favorite bookstore. Also, uh, check out James's memoir, Jimmy Neuroses from Echo Press sometime. It is an awfully good book. And that's the subject of our earlier podcast conversation. I'll give you a link to that in this one. Uh, James's website, it's gorgeous to look at, but kind of sparse. It's in the process of being updated. It is jamesosland.com if you want to check it out. And that's J-A-M-E-S-O-S-E-L-A-N-D.com. He's also on Twitter and Instagram at James Osland, spelled the same way, all one word. Now, in the before time, this is when I would ask you for support for the, the podcast through my Patreon or PayPal. Um, I, as I've told you many times over the course of this year, don't want your financial support, your your verbal or emotional support or whatever sort of support I, I would appreciate through letters, postcards, emails, whatever. Tell me what you like and don't like about the show, but don't commit any money to helping me with this. Um, my job is treating me fine. My finances are okay. Uh, the expenses for the show are way down because I'm not traveling anywhere, uh, not going into the city, parking, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Everything is just 20 bucks a month for Zencaster, 20 bucks a month for the podcast hosting service. So if you have money to spare, um, I'd really appreciate it if you gave to individuals in need through their GoFundMes, Kickstarters, Indiegogos, Patreons, um, foundations and institutions in need like food banks, freedom funds. There are a lot of ways that you can help people right now. And um, it's been a tough year. I just hope that if you're in a position to help someone, you will. Uh, last word, I still have some copies left of the very first issue of my very first zine, Haiku for Business Travelers. I am working less productively than I'd hoped on issue number two during this this week between Christmas and New Year's. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. The key one is that I'm an anxiety-ridden neurotic wreck who's afraid that you're all going to find out what a fraud I am. The upshot is none of you listen to the end of the episode, so you're never going to hear this part. Anyway, um, if you want the first issue of Haiku for Business Travelers, it's free. Just drop me a line or visit haikuforbusinesstravelers.com and fill out the little form there. You can send me a couple of bucks for postage and production if you want, but this is, um, <laughs> I'd say it's my gift. It's my curse upon you all to, to try to share my art, such as it is. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M A Y the number four, TH. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. 
You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. Music